Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Patricia Turner. I am the Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of the American College of Surgeons, and it's really my pleasure to invite all of you uh, here this morning. And I want to thank you for joining me and, and my colleagues here um, on the dais um, as we talk with leaders in the DC hospital space about quality, about the power of quality and how we enhance quality in surgery for our patients. So I'm going to start out this morning with a short video uh, so we can roll the, roll the clip to set the stage. The QVB process brings people together who don't necessarily interact every day. There is a significant positive impact since we implemented uh, quality programs, and it's measurable. Patients are doing better in surgery, they're doing better post-operatively, therefore their outcomes are better. We've been able to make many more milestones than if we didn't have that in place. really gave us an opportunity to really stand up and think about what it means to deliver surgical care at a high level of excellence. Let's face it, there's room for all of us to improve. The surgeon or the nurse or the anesthesiologist, anyone on that surgical team has a role in delivering a higher quality care. And people feel good about that. looks like on the ground. Uh, you can experience with those individuals who are in the video their commitment to improving patient outcomes. And you can hear how our ACS quality programs are integrated into those efforts to help their teams do the best work. And as you can see, we are all striving to be as effective and efficient as possible. And that is fundamentally the power of quality. And that's what brings us together this morning. So it's a privilege to be here with you and with our panelists to discuss the power of quality and discuss how we can all work together to most effectively deliver the best quality and highest quality surgical care for our patients. For more than 100 years, and in fact I was having a conversation just uh, as we were chatting in the back, for more than 100 years the American College of Surgeons has been at the forefront of surgical quality. Um, it has been a hallmark of what we do since we were founded in 1913. Uh, if we go back to uh, Codman and, and Franklin Martin and others, this is the core of what we do. We are concerned about enhancing the quality and outcomes of surgery patients, and that is our motto, to heal all with skill and trust. So we built quality programs across the entire spectrum of surgical care, um, and we offer a roadmap for teams to enhance their quality, and current national strategies for enhancing quality don't always incorporate the elements of a rigorous evidence-based set of solutions. So using administrative data or claims data to drive change is not the most effective way to impact our outcomes. And so this is why we continue our, our century-old mission to improve surgical quality, working with all of you as hospital partners to make a difference. So we're driving a national conversation, and key to that is making sure that we have all of the stakeholders engaged and that we think about how to impact the payers, those who may not be front-facing patient care providers at every turn, to engage them in the conversation as well. Hospital leaders, others in the perioperative space, each of you, you're all part of the conversation. So as a practicing surgeon, um, I recognize how this impacts us every day as we care for patients. I recognize that all of us are um, in our institutions at different places along the healthcare journey. Some have been deeply engaged in this process and it is part of the culture. Uh, some of us are relatively newer uh, to this conversation and need support to see how you can bring about that culture of safety and trust and change. And the American College of Surgeons is here to support you in that. Um, I know that everyone here is passionate about this. I know that everyone here wants to do the best thing for our patients. And today marks what will be the start of a national effort to engage communities, everyone on the care team, policymakers, regulators, payers, and patients on this critical subject. So the healthcare system has to support everyone on the team. Uh, we have to support across the entire spectrum of what we do as surgeons. 
We are the engines that drive many institutions, and as a result, we have to be part of the conversation. This is not something that can be done in isolation without the clinicians and the patient providing surgeons in the conversation. So the healthcare system has some opportunities, uh, some opportunities for us to, uh, to change some things that aren't going the way that we want them to, to go and to enhance things that are going well. And so as we bring together uh, our esteemed panelists, they'll share their thoughts. I'm excited to hear from them to discuss this critical issue. I thank all of you for being here this morning. I recognize that we're all a part of this conversation and I look forward to ongoing conversations about how we can impact, uh, at the end of the day, the outcome of the surgical patient. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Tanisha Carino to introduce our panelists and get us started. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Turner. I'm Tanisha Carino, and I'm a partner at the Brunswick Group. I'm delighted to chair this esteemed panel. I've spent 25 plus years working to improve patient lives in the healthcare system and leadership in government, nonprofit, and the for-profit sector. And it takes all of these sectors working together under this rallying cry for the power of quality for us to achieve the outcomes that I know every single one of us wants out of the system. And our panelists today are gonna to tell you exactly what that means to them today, an outlook for the future, and make this idea of the power of quality very tangible. So with that, I've asked each of the panelists to open with some just opening remarks to give you all some grounding on their perspective. We're gonna to go to a moderated discussion, and I'm really hoping that we have enough time to take one or two questions from the audience before Dr. Turner closes us out. So with that, I'd love to invite Dr. Clifford Coe, who's the director of ACS's Division of Research in Optimal Patient Care to start. The division houses all of ACS's quality improvement initiatives, including programs in trauma care, cancer care, pediatric surgical care, age-friendly surgery, and also its national and international clinical data registries. With over 4,000 sites in the United States participating in an ACS quality program, Dr. Koh and his team touch millions of lives each year to improve their quality of care. In addition to his role at ACS, Dr. Koh is the Robert and Kelly Day Professor of Surgery at UCLA and a Professor of Health Services at UCLA's Public Health School. And in his spare time, he's also pursuing a doctorate in Cambridge to even more so understand how to drive and improve our quality of care here. Dr. Ko. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Crean. I can't learn enough, so yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're always learning. Um, well, good morning, everybody, and, and thank you for having us here. Um, I, maybe I can start off by saying that I think everyone in the room believes in their heart that quality is paramount. We need to strive continually to achieve quality, and we never uh, are, should be satisfied with the quality we are at. We constantly have to get better. Here in DC, 20 years ago, the Institute of Medicine released the report to Errors Human, where 100,000 uh, deaths were occurring needlessly. And since that time, that really spurred on this movement of quality. And at that time, when we looked at mortality, we wanted quality to be safe. We, we didn't want to have patient harms. Now, in the ensuing 20 years, we really defined the different domains of quality of not just safety, but timeliness, effectiveness, efficiency, uh, patient-centered, and equitable. And these are the things that make healthcare right now increasingly complex. In the landscape now, that is increasingly even more, makes it more difficult and complex. And so one of the things about this campaign is that we want everyone to join the college and everyone working together collaboratively to redouble our efforts and prioritizing and committing to achieving quality. I think in this, uh, in this session here, we will talk about, I will talk about a lot of uh, our, uh, everyone here on the panel will talk about our experience with the American College of Surgeons quality programs and what we actually have been working on for decades, even before the Two Errors Human Report came out. And we really now want to share what we have done, what our experiences are, what the evidence has shown, and a proven way to achieve this quality, this increasingly complex quality in the current landscape. So. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Ko. It's my pleasure to next introduce Dr. Sadawi, who is the professor and the Lewis B. Saltz Chair of the Department of Surgery here at George Washington University. He is currently serving as the Board of Regents of the American College of Surgeons and is the past president of the Society for Vascular Surgery. He served on the Quality Committee of the Board of Regents for the ACS in the last six years. He's an academic vascular surgeon with over 150 peer-reviewed articles, 60 chapters, and an editor of three books in the specialty. Thank you, Dr. Sadawi, for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Karina. And thank you all for being here. Now, quality occupies a center stage in the American College of Surgeons. The quality structure reports to the highest level of management as represented by Dr. Turner and governance as represented by the Board of Regents. So I will start by saying in this day and age of complex technology, surgery has more and more become a team sport. And this is extremely important because the whole surgical team and all its component needs to be aligned on quality principles for surgical programs to be successful from quality and outcomes perspectives. This applies to the whole continuum of care, preoperative, intraoperative, postoperative, and even post-discharge from the hospital. Now, one very important component of that team are the trainees in teaching hospitals, medical students, residents, fellows. Not only they should be aligned with the rest of the surgical team, but also they need to be trained in the principles of surgical quality early on in their training for quality to become part and parcel of their education process. Therefore, the American College of Surgeons as the House of Surgery put together last year a summit of organizations involved in surgical education to start planning how to incorporate surgical quality education in the various stages of surgical training. In this summit, the college also included subspecialty societies since most fellowship programs are subspecialty programs. Actually, the college is now collaborating with subspecialty societies to establish new quality verification programs. A case in point is the vascular surgery quality verification programs that was launched just three weeks ago by the American College of Surgeons and the Society for Vascular Surgery. As a vascular regent of the college, I worked on the process of putting together that program for over three years, got a bit delayed because of COVID, but now we have it. Now, one might ask, why this collaboration? What's the benefit of it? Well, we believe this is a match made in heaven because on one side, the college with over 100 years, as you heard from Dr. Turner, 100 year experience in this area, and the complex infrastructure that the college has built over the years. And on the other side, the specialty society with its intricate knowledge of the specialty, its practice guidelines, reporting standards, together are able to produce very comprehensive, clinically oriented programs for the patient's benefit. And lastly, I would like to emphasize that at the center of this whole effort has always been the patient. By improving clinical outcomes as measured by data entry into approved registries, using risk-adjusted analysis comparing a certain hospital to national outcomes benchmark, and periodic site visits of the programs ensuring the presence of the appropriate infrastructure as indicated by standards specific to that particular specialty will result in appropriate, equitable, and outcomes measured clinical care. <clears throat> and a verified hospital using this comprehensive process, we believe will gain public trust. Thank you for the invite and for participating in this excellent panel. Thank you, Dr. Sadawi, for also putting center the importance of the patient, addressing issues around health equity, and the importance of training that next generation of leaders. 
So I'm delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Jones, who is the president and CEO of Innova Health System, a Northern Virginia nonprofit hospital system, integrated system, excuse me, and actually my provider in my local neighborhood in Alexandria, which is exciting. Um, Innova provides more than two million patient visits each year through its integrated network of hospitals, physician practices, emergency and urgent care centers, outpatient services, and destination institutes. All five of Innova's hospitals are consistently recognized by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the LeapFrog Group for their performance and their commitment to quality. Innova is home to Northern Virginia's only level one trauma center and level four neonatal intensive care unit. Finally, Dr. Jones is a board certified practicing urological surgeon. He's also professor of surgery Oh, sorry, urology at the University of Virginia. We have very busy people here on this panel. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jones. Th thanks so much. Appreciate the opportunity to be part of this and to uh, speak on behalf of this work. Uh, I think as the CEO of an organization, you know, my responsibility is um, broad. But at the end of the day, I think why we focus on quality, and I want to go beyond just quality, is that twofold. One is it's the right thing to do. I mean, this is not rocket science. We want to have quality, but... When I trained 35 years ago, uh, when we talked quality, it was with a small cube. I mean, we just said we're good, and we actually, it's easy to say you're good, but then we actually look at outcomes, then you figure out that Correct. none of us is, good, is as good as we should ultimately be. So that at the point where we qu quit improving is the point when we should probably start thinking about stopping because there, it, it should always be a journey. Uh, the second is that we don't look at quality in a, in a a silo any more than we look at any of our individual hospitals, and that'll tie to some of this work that we've done here, uh, is that we look at clinical excellence. So you've got quality as a part of that, safety as a part of that, patient experience. And then to Dr. Coe's point, you know, I think we even have a responsibility to have financial stewardship, both of our resources, but as importantly, our community and our patients' resources. So the, that for us, to have that mindset of that we will continually improve to be the best and that we will never accept that we can't be better is a, is a part of the natural journey that we're on. And we think it's the right, by the way, business decision as well. It's not a trade-off of quality versus, you know, the financial performance of an organization. I understand there are those who may not quite embrace that. But we don't see it as that just, well, it's a nice thing to do, so we're going to take the cost of that. We think that we can meet all of those needs by embracing all of this in a holistic fashion. It's wonderful. And I love the call to action that's that this is a continual journey, that in fact we should never stop, and that quality needs to be seen in the context of all the other goals institutions have to provide clinical excellent care and to be strong fiduciaries of their own, rev own budgets, but also a community and their patients' budgets as well. Thank you so much. So Dr. Edmonston, thank you for joining us. Thank you. You're thank a breast oncology surgeon. Yep. And within the Innova Health System, you've served in multiple leadership roles in surgical quality care and safety. Today you serve as the surgery, surgical quality officer and the director of clinical excellence for the Unova Surgery Service Line. And you're also an assistant professor of surgery at the University of Virginia Innova campus. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. You know, we've talked a lot about quality as sort of an abstract construct. And one of the things that I've been thinking about and wanted to share with you of what this really looks like at the, not only at the hospital level, at the surgeon level, but really across our entire system. And so I think about our journey as going through the quality verification program through the American College of Surgeons and thinking about what does that mean? And what it really helped us to do was to build on the culture of safety that Dr. Jones and everybody had brought here and thinking about how do we create not only a culture of psychological safety, but really engaging people in service lines, right, where we bring together the surgeons, the anesthesiologists, our um, cardiothoracic surgeons, our neurosurgeons, and our musculoskeletal surgeons or, or orthopedics, and thinking about across the house of surgery, how do we really affect that quality change? And I think it, that actually it's relatively simple. I'll, I'll, in concept, but really the devil's in the details. And so it's thinking about, okay, not only do we take that, that culture of safety where people feel comfortable at speaking up, we know so often that if you look at when something bad has happened, people recognize it, but they feel afraid to, to speak up. 
And so it's really creating that culture where people feel, no matter where they are within the team, that they feel comfortable about saying, hey, wait a minute, something's wrong. And then it's also about, from a leadership perspective, whether it's within the breast world or across all of the house of surgery, of saying, what are our goals, it, for the, whether it's for this year or for across, going forward across all five hospitals, and then saying, okay, how do we really affect those changes? How do we look at the data? And this is where I think partnering with the ACS is such a critical function, whether it's with our NISQIP database, whether it's with our trauma database, whether it's with the pediatric NISQIP. I mean, I could go on and on, but it's looking at that data and recognizing the strength of it, not just as a point in time, but looking at the 30-day follow-up for patients so that we can then say, how do we not only decrease surgical site infections, but then also how do we look at re decreasing returns to the OR, our length of stay, and then fundamentally going beyond that to the next level saying, how do we get them back to work earlier? How do we get our patients back to, into their lives and doing what they love doing, what matters most to them? And so I think that's really the strength of this collaboration, whether it's a big hospital like Fairfax or a small hospital, um, a more community hospital. I think the goals and the, and the opportunities in partnership are really the same. It's to use those 12 standards or to use the data registry to say, how are we going to, in a very concrete way, how are we going to improve the care? Thank you so much, Dr. Sure. Evanson. I really appreciate your perspective about what it means to create that <clears throat> culture that allows teams to continue to do what Dr. Jones has referred to, which is continually improve. Um, and in that, I really want to dig a little bit deeper on this idea of collaboration. Dr. Turner really started us off by saying it's going to take every single person in this room, the whole community, everyone that cares about improving patient outcomes, improving the health of a community, to work together. You know, in, from your perspective and having really been on the front line of seeing what that teamwork means, like how has that changed over time? And in this part of the discussion, I may not want all of you to weigh in on these big questions, but I'm asking Dr. Edmondson first, what does teamwork mean even outside of the context of the media team who's working to achieve these specific goals and looking at that data over and over to see what can happen to change? Well, I think it's, you're right. It's not just the immediate team. When we think about the surgeons, the anesthesiologists, our primary care collaborators in terms of, for example, pre-op optimization. But as we've seen so clearly now in the ongoing work around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and looking at our social determinants of health, it's really expanding that partnership to include our primary care providers, to include our, our local county governments to say, how do we find the resources, for example, for that patient who doesn't have the ability to have transportation to come back to their follow-up appointments? Because if we're really going to make an impact, not just in terms of the immediate outcomes, but again, getting them back into their lives and achieving those long-term outcomes, we need to bring all of those people together to focus on the patient and their families. Thank you, Dr. Edmondson. I'd like to hear a little bit more from Dr. Jones and Dr. Sadawi about this idea of the community. Hospitals are a major driver, economic driver, talent driver, employer, but a force for change in any community that they serve. How have you seen this focus on quality change the way you think about partnership for your institutions and communities? Well, I mean, uh, one of the areas uh, that I would like to emphasize, actually, which I don't believe we really talk too much about, is that how to involve the patient and their families, actually, in that whole process. And I think that becomes extremely important because they will start understanding what's going on, and they help themselves, and they will help us take care of them. And th they are part, obviously, of that community. Actually, they are the closest community to the patient, the family, if they do, uh, if they do have a family around them. 
Um, this is an area, I think, that we haven't really much approached. I don't, uh, we do educate patients before they leave the hostel, but we don't extend that to their homes. And I believe post-surgical post care at times, it can become more efficient and more effective by doing so. Thank you, Dr. Sadawi. Dr. Jones. Yeah, I'll tie a little bit back to the concept of team. And uh, as surgeons, many of us normal surgeons, there are a few things more satisfying than finishing that case when you know that while that was a hard case and, and I did something that, that not everybody can do, that's deeply gratifying. And that's a tiny part of the patient's actual surgical experience, okay? Uh, and so that, although it's part we remember, that's not even the part the patient remembers. And, and you take examples of the importance of team with that, that person who cleans the, the room or the instruments, okay, at least as important as the, the, the work that happens in the operating room. Um, Dr. Espen spoke up on psychological safety. We had an experience at Nova Alexandria Hospital not that long ago where one of the surgeons came to me and said, I want to tell you about something that happened in the operating room. Yeah. And it was that about to close, noticed that there was dusky bowel, a situation in which there could have been an extremely bad outcome. Mm -hmm. And one of the people in the operating room spoke up and said, doctor, before you close, can you take a look at that? He took a look. We don't really know whether that made a difference or not. What we do know is that when we speak up and we put that, as they say in the software world, when you put enough eyes on a bug, all bugs get easy. Mm -hmm. When you put enough eyes on a problem, problems get easier. So yeah. that continuum from in the operating room to speak up to that, making sure the patient knows when they get home, what medicines do I take and what activities do I do? That, that continuum there is how we ultimately will change the game. It probably won't be by surgeons getting one specific surgical move made better as much as all those pieces making sure that it's a chain. The weakest link breaks, getting that entire chain is, I think, exactly. the, the key to our outcome. Nobody wants to be the weakest link. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, Dr. Coe, when you think about this conversation, and the, it's not just about the procedure, like you're the architect of quality programs. What does this mean to you in terms of the current future of data, how we capture data, how we make sure that the evidence that's being collected really speaks to the type of actions that each of your colleagues want to take moving forward. Sure, so thank you. I think that where we are now, 23 years after the Two Errors Human report came out, is that quality has become so much more complex. Quality has become so much more uh, sophisticated. And when we think about just a simple measure of mortality 20 years ago to now, we are in different domains of quality. We have a lot of different metrics that we have to deal with that it becomes increasingly complex for us to do that. The best way to do that is with data because we want to know exactly what's going on. We need it to be risk adjusted and all the analytics that uh, our computers are helping us to do uh, to know how we're doing. But I think a key thing right now is that we have so many metrics, but we don't know how to improve on those metrics. We are told our mortality rate is this, our infection rate is this, our, you know, our, uh, our urinary tract infection is this, our pneumonia rate is this. Uh, and when we talk with hospitals and when we share data with them, the biggest question is, well, how do we fix this? How do we fix this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing and how do we really do this in an efficient, organized manner. What the college has done, and, just, and it came to us that we need to have not just the data and the metrics that tell us how we're doing, but we need to figure out and share with everybody how to get better. And that's what these quality programs do. The quality programs have set standards that set up what are the things we need to do and what are the infrastructure and resources we need to do them. If we just say like your rate of outcome is this without letting people know, letting hospitals know, letting doctors know, letting the whole team know what to do, it becomes a free for all. And that's I think what we see a lot, of, that's why we have a lot of variability in healthcare. We need to standardize how we do the processes. We need to standardize our resources and how we organize our care. And if we know something that works and we have thousands of hospitals where we've worked with for decades and figured out how these things work, and so now that's what we want to promote now is not just measuring the outcomes with great data, which is clearly essential, but what is needed to actually improve the care. We need to improve how, we need to improve improvement. We need to get better at getting better. And so I think that's what the college is trying to share with, with everyone and working together to do this. 
Thank you, Dr. Coe. I really love the, the forward-looking perspective of this is not just about reporting. This is not a point-in-time discussion. It takes that work to continue to improve. Um, I want to turn to you, Dr. Jones. You know, cr to create the future that I think we're all talking about in the data infrastructure that will be in place, it also takes a change of mindset. You know, all of us have been in organizations where if the tone from the top isn't exactly right and given the direction of what's important, then it's hard, even with the best tools and intentions, to take the action that people may want to take in an institution. For you, since you have walked this walk, like how would you advise others to try to take the mindset about the centrality of quality with all of the other challenges and all of the other agendas that are on the top of everyone's mind that in, are in your roles in institutions? How, how do you take that first step? I think you, uh, it's important to develop clarity on what you're gonna really focus on and to then, once you make that commitment, go all the way. So if you're an organization that, that says our full um, uh, reason for being here is financial, then you probably need to go all the way on that, but that's not the, the direction that we've chosen, or I think the direction that most of the people who are in this discussion, not only in this room, but beyond, are, are on. We want to get there. But it's easy that if you say, we're gonna commit to deliver, delivering the, the, the most excellent quality, safety, patient experience that can possibly be delivered, and then you hit a hard quarter, or then you hit a staffing issue, or then hit whatever, it's easy unless you've got a commitment that we are gonna not take our eye off the ball on this. And you know, yeah, there's no doubt that tone has to be at the top, but that has to be an alignment among every leader in the organization, and I think really importantly, that board of that organization as well. So once you lock in on that, so let's face it, you know, less than two years when I was in my role, COVID hit. And then we had multiple crises, racial uh, challenges across the country, financial challenges, staffing challenges. At any point of those, it would have been easy to take our eye off the ball. But we had clarity on this is gonna be the thing we're gonna focus on. So regardless of how we deal with all these challenges, we're not gonna take our eye off the ball on this. And if you don't have that clarity, you have to question whether you'll be successful in that, uh, that journey. It's wonderful. And Dr. Sadawi, you've already talked about the importance of the future generation. Correct. You're a leader in your own institution. I would love your reflections on how to create the, the expectation and that mindset among our rising leaders. How do you maintain, even as a regent for the college, that hopefully provides a little bit of the lift of thinking about that broader culture of the power for quality that institutions can be successful in? You know, this is actually one of the most important questions uh, that uh, we need to deal with when we talk about quality, is that how you're going to change a culture in the organization to make everyone uh, believe in it and act that way. And I really believe it starts from the top down, and it also goes from the bottom up. And something like this doesn't happen overnight. It's gonna need, need time, it's gonna need persistence, and it's gonna need leadership that really believe in it. And when the leadership believe in it and act it day after day after day and train people to get there, as I mentioned talking about resident uh, students and fellows, but not all hostels in the country are teaching hostels. So although they're part of the team, but the issue is the leadership that will set the principles and act that way day in, day out. And people will ask the question, as Dr. Jones mentioned, a lot of organiza healthcare organizations now are struggling after COVID financially. We know that. It's reported on the news all the time. And you say, well, isn't that gonna cost money doing that? So is it the right time actually to do that? Well, the argument is, as one time, I heard from that co actually, is maybe this is the time because quality would lead to efficiency, would lead to less cost. So you will be able to run your hospital in more efficient way and provide a better outcome to the patient. That's great. Can I add yes. on, build on what Dr. Sadawi said that I think nowadays with, with price transparency and we're talking about money, 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 um, that if we chase the dollar, if we decrease our costs, 
we don't necessarily get to better quality. Sometimes we get to worse quality when we are cutting, cutting, cutting. And we see that, I'm sure everyone sees that it, all around them. Uh, to pick up on what Dr. Sadawi said, however, if we prioritize quality and quality gets better and there's less complications and we don't have to do a readmission and we don't have to have the patient come through the ER, the ED, the emergency department, uh, and we don't have a complication where we need to get radiology involved and get more tests, and we make things more streamlined, then that does save money. We know that. We've shown that over and over again in trauma care and in cancer care and in mm -hmm. care of children and care of the older adult. And so really focusing on the quality piece will get us to better money things. But if we focus on the money, we don't necessarily get to the better quality. So that's a huge part of this campaign is that focusing on quality will get us what we want, but it has to be that prioritization of quality. If I may add one thing very Absolutely. quickly. Absolutely, it's to supposed that. to be a discussion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the most common questions as a regent at the college that other surgeons ask me all the time. If we're doing well, and we're becoming more efficient, and we are respecting all these principles of quality, our patients doing well, and we're actually saving money, how come insurers, whether they're governmental or third-party payers, are not rewarding us for that? So when is the time? And this is what surgeons ask quite often. Yeah. So when is the time that insurers, again, to include government payers, gonna look and say, if you're participating in these programs of the American College of Surgeons, and you are achieving a certain level, we're gonna reward you. When that's gonna happen? I think that will become very important to what Dr. Koh was saying, and in that, people will start adopting all these principles of quality, yeah. adopting the college program, because they also know as CEOs and as department chairs yeah. that that's going to lead to better reimbursement in their area. Yeah. So, Tanisha, Absolutely. If, if I can add on in another point, you know, as we've seen the expansion of LeapFrog and U.S. News and World Report rankings, patients and con who are really ultimately consumers as well are looking for sources of quality verification. Yes, we are. And so if we think about this quality campaign and, and the verification, whether it be through QVP or through the trauma program, that really is another clear validation of not only the quality at individual levels, but really across the whole system. And that, I think, as pa particularly as patients and consumers become smarter, and are looking for that data and that validation, this then becomes an even stronger reason for hospitals, whether they be big or small, urban hospitals, community hospitals out in the southwest Kansas, for example. How do we then use that? And that's, I think, this is one of the biggest reasons, in addition to not only making us better, yeah but because this is what the patients and consumers are looking for. And they, they are very, very insistent and are gonna drive, make their healthcare decisions based off of it. Yeah, I love the fact that you brought this up because I think so many of us as consumers, we're, we're inundated with information. You can give too much information, but what we lack oftentimes is the point several of you have brought up, which is, who can we trust? Where do we put our trust? And you know, Dr. Jones, I'd love to talk, have you reflect on that as an, as an institutional leader, as a community leader in this area. Like, what does this idea of trust, the focus on quality, mean to you as somebody who is interacting with so many different aspects of our communities? Yeah, it's foundational, and it's funny that you know, those quotes that I frequently talk about, especially when we're talking with partners is that we are literally in the trust business. Is that why would anyone possibly come into any one of our doors? Why would anyone possibly trust us with our hands unless there, there is that trust uh, to be a little bit redundant there? And, and so I think to Dr. Edmonds's point there, we see, um, we see hospitals around the country that are saying they're not seeing as many patients now. And we see hospitals like ours, which actually we can't hardly take care of all the patients that we have a need for. And I believe strongly it's because we have that trust. They know that in that moment of need, yeah. mm -hmm. having a child and needing a, a ruptured aortic aneurysm, 
they know that they want to go to someone that they, that they can trust. So I believe it, it is a key driver of our business. I think it's a sacred trust, by the way, too, because it's easy to break that trust. If at, one, at some point they think that we don't have their best interest in mind, that one time, if I, if I thought that, I would never allow another family member of mine to go to that, that hospital. So I think that it's both as, as systems, hospitals, and as individual surgeons. Well, we're sitting here at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., the heart of the most powerful drivers that are setting a framework for the incentives that exist in healthcare that said, send signals, maybe arbitrarily, for things that they may not, it may not realize some of the consequences that this panel has talked about. You know, if you're to wave your magic wand um, seeing sort of the disconnect between the signals that are being sent and what you believe is needed to continue this progression towards the improving patient care, putting patients within the center of what you do. Like, what do you, what would you want to tell the policymaking community? What's needed to make all of your lives easier to continue to drive for that type of excellence? I would, um, I would tell them that surgical quality is different than when different in, in that it needs to have different parameters uh, rather than what now they're applying uh, in the hospitals at, at large. And the American College of Surgeons actually is the go-to organization for that. Um, it's very important, obviously, what we do, the county and CLAPSI and all that stuff in the hospital. But there are so many other parameters that surgery has to live with in order to achieve a certain level of quality that is uh, comparable and that is uh, providing the patient with the appropriate care, with excellent outcomes. That's number one. And number two, as I mentioned before, let's start thinking how are we going to reward that? Uh, so, so hospitals like uh, Dr. Jones Hospital, he's the CEO, putting all the work, putting all the expense to improve quality, then they should be rewarded. And I think that's what policymakers now are not connecting, in my opinion, and also in the opinion of a lot of surgeons that I talk with. Thanks, Dr. Sadawi. Anyone else want to reflect on that question? I, I think. Uh, yeah, it's hard to measure a lot of important things. It's been said that, you know, only measure things that matter. You know, I would ask, do you love your family? Well, you can't measure it, but you know you love your family. <laughs> and, and so it's easy to, to measure some of these, especially the early quality metrics. Harder to measure, you know, that, that completeness of the, the overall care that one gets. So that I would just be cautious to not get stuck on surrogates that aren't meaningful, yep. including, you know, uh, you know, most of what the press is interested in is cost, okay? Appropriately so, with no focus on really what is being obtained for that cost. And I can't tell you it's simple to get there, but if I gave advice, it would be to dig deeper and look at what are we really getting out of the healthcare system? And if we're getting delivered quality care, that certainly should be rewarded. If we're not getting quality care, not only should it not be as rewarded as well, but also it means that we need to focus because we're not getting that quality. Great, Dr. Jones. I'd like to add something where What's happening now in the healthcare landscape for, and, uh, and if we talk about surgery and surgery being done in hospitals, is that we are inundated, hospitals are inundated with the performance metrics that they have to comply with. So just in surgery at the hospitals I visited, I've spoken at, I work at, there are over 300 metrics just within mm -hmm. surgery that our hospitals have to do, 300. Fixing one of them Addressing one of them takes a huge effort. Right. There's 300 that when we last looked, uh, and I was at a hospital giving a talk the other day, that how do we fix these? I'm like, oh, and then I turned the page. How do we fix this one? How to, and like, it's a stack of things that hospitals are having to do. Now, that's great. These things need to get better. However, the alignment, the overlap of what the frontline teams taking care of the surgical patient is not enough. That overlap is not enough because we have our hospitals working on these things, but our clinicians are working on something else when they're trying to take care of a patient. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the policymakers and the college is part of this should be really figuring out how do we make this overlap. So yeah. if we're working on these quality metrics and these performance uh, ways to do things better should overlap with the care that we're giving every day to a patient. 
So I'll give you an example. Recently, I operated on this one week, I operated on somebody who's 32 years old and another person who was 101 years old. Wow. The way we do these things and the way we think about quality is very different. And so, but that should be integrated into what we are doing. And the way we evaluate quality, the way we achieve quality should take those things into account so that our efforts are really aligned. And so if I can take one more minute that we think at the college we have a program for older adults and surgery in the older adults, that the quality should be really focused in the patient-centeredness way of what that person's goals are. Certainly a person who's 32, their goals for an operation are very different than a patient who is 101. And we need to really focus in on what that individualized quality is for both of those patients and how do we do it in an efficient, effective, timely, all of those things way. And too much now, we're, we're, the, the way we're trying to achieve quality is too separate. We need to align those things so that what's in the patient's best interest is also what we are being incentivized to do. And we have an opportunity there to make things much, much better. Thank you, Dr. Ko. Before we open for uh, any questions from the audience, I'd love for you to reflect on what Dr. Ko is saying when it comes to these teams that see exactly what they want to improve on and have to operate within the macro reporting environment that exists. How do you keep them focused? How do you keep them sort of continuing to be like focused on what's important? Well, I think it's about, you know, at the very beginning of whatever time period, it's about saying these are our priorities. Yeah. To, to everybody's point, there are hundreds of metrics that we can focus on. But if we try to boil the ocean, as I say, and we try to focus on all of them all at once, we end up achieving nothing. And so it's really about saying for a particular time, and as, the, for example, within clinical excellence at ANOVA, we think about, okay, what are we going to focus on and prioritize for this period of time? And then we really engage everybody about not only that metric, but that goal. And what it does by extension is, is that it changes the culture so that we then are thinking about all of the quality issues that we need to focus on and all of the outcomes, and it really changes that culture. As we think about it, each of those specific individual events leads to people's expectations, people's perceptions about what's happening within an organization, which then that success then begets additional yeah. success. And I think that's where we have to focus because we can't do everything all at once, but we need to continue to move that, that needle forward in that journey. You know, we often talk about the journey towards high reliability. And we say, okay, at some point we will get there. But I would, I would promote and submit that we may never get to the ultimate goal of zero harm. But it's that journey that we're on together that leads that culture to make us not only better in our current world, but makes us also much more nimble and much more capable when we have to deal with things like COVID or when there are massive staffing shortages. We have that culture oh. of being able to make decisions quickly, to be able to respond to challenges. Because to think that we're going to, that things are gonna remain stable is just completely not true. We are gonna, we're, as we go forward, we're going to see even more changes, whether it's related to COVID or some other epidemic or some other national disaster, we're going to have to need to be able to respond to those and having that culture and that infrastructure that is so well appreciated and so well supported and developed in collaboration with the college helps us to be able to respond to those challenges. Thank you so much. I have one, I have one thing. I think Absolutely. it's really important to, to be transparent and everyone have access to the information. So, you know, when I first came to Nova, for example, one of the specialties came to me and bragged about, you know, we're all well trained, we're the best in the country. And I said, well, how do you know that? And, you know, kind of silence. Well, to their credit, they came back about two weeks ago and we had our annual check in where they went and looked at their own quality. And they came in probably showing a report showing not only that indeed that they were phenomenal, uh -huh. but by the way, they'd gotten better over the last four years in the time that they had been focusing on that. So, but unless everybody sees that, it's always easy to say I'm doing a great job. Because yeah. yeah. you, know, you had one wound infection. Okay, well, actually it was five, but I kind of I forgot about it over time. 
when you really look at the data and you see that you've got yeah. wound infections mm -hmm. are in excess, then you can focus on it. But you've got to make sure everyone who has an impact can see those data because it's always easy to hide unless you have to look at them together. So the more transparent we are with our data, you know, posting, you name it, yeah. the, the, mm -hmm. the things you decide when you, and frankly, put them on the surgeon's, uh, you know, room door is a good example. <laughs> when you're looking at that and your infection rate's higher than everybody else's, That's right. no surgeon in the building. We're wants, humans, yeah. right? Right. That behavior, yeah. and, and, I, and I love the idea of this idea of reporting that transparency within institutions, but even across institutions, across communities, we all want to be better, we all want to be the best. Yeah. Want the bragging right. So I want to be able to at least take one or two questions and looking at my colleagues on what, how much time we have. Any questions from the audience? Great, please um, introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, fantastic conversation. Um, where do I start? Talithia McBride, I'm the Vice President of Quality at the Federation of, of American Hospitals. Um, so as I hear this conversation and I think about what my members are dealing with, right? Um, and this is, this transcends this area, the Washington DC inside the Beltway, right? Um, rural communities um, and communities that didn't expand <laughs> uh, Medicaid. Uh, uh, um, the, politi the politicization of quality. Um, wherein this was probably in my 25 year career focusing on quality where quality measurement science, the evidence was debated, right? Um, and as we're coming out of COVID in the ending of the public health emergency, what that brings in terms of what hospitals have to prioritize, competing priorities, we talked about, you talked about measurement burden. We saw our quality programs at the federal level weren't resilient to handle COVID, right? We saw measure suppression policies put in place, a lack of transparency. We don't have the folks, we don't have the staff to actually maintain uh, safety protocols that were in place pre-COVID. So now that the administration has come back and said, hey, we, we wanna target zero preventable harm in the next five years, how do we get there? Um, what is the role of innovation when we aren't gonna return back to pre-COVID in terms of infrastructure? People aren't entering the healthcare industry like they used to. What, what are your answers for that in terms of recruiting young talent to be surgeons, to be nurses? Um, I could go on, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Take any of all of that question. <laughs> you can say anything and it would answer something. Uh, <laughs> can we, we'll Tell me, with. it's basically how are we going to make this better? <laughs> so, oh, go on. Please, well, please, I'll please, take please. just a little bit of it. One is I think that's where, indeed, you have to have outside resources. You have to come together. And, and this is a great example. If in any one of your individual hospitals you try to solve all this, there's no way, no right? Way. But, but you have a whole country of people here. You have a whole community of surgeons around you that you can reach out on. And you're not going to be able to boil the ocean, as Dr. Edmonds had said. Mm -hmm. but, but if you can take those that really matter and you can agree on them and you can find the support around, I think that's the best solution because you're not going to be able to do it on your own. That's, that's frankly how we, I think we've done well as a system is we didn't try to solve it as one right. department or as one hospital. We said, and so when, when Dr. Edmonds and Dr. Moynihan came to me and said, you know, we want to be, to my knowledge, the first to be involved in this as a system, you know, what do you think about that? I said, this ties to everything we've said, that, that we'll, we will become a system and that we will focus on clinical excellence. To me, that was why it was such a no-brainer to get yeah. in, involved. Uh, and we, we're the beneficiaries of that, and more importantly, the patients in our communities are the beneficiaries of that. I, I know that when, so I've been with the College of Surgeons for over a decade, and when we develop and we constantly iterate our quality program, we have 18 quality programs in trauma care, and cancer care, and, and, and so forth, uh, we are constantly iterating our, our programs for the exact things that you're saying. That does this work in a university setting? Does it work when we don't have residents and we're not training, but we're in the community? Does it work in a rural setting? Does it work in the safety net critical access settings and, and so forth? And so uh, if I take the trauma uh, example, if you're driving down the road on the freeway in traffic in Los Angeles and you see an accident, 
do we know that that person who is injured will have the best chance of going to a trauma center, right? right? You don't want them to go to a right. non-trauma center. We know that they will do best, the mm -hmm. best outcomes if they go to a trauma center. So then what's the next step? Well, what is a trauma center? What is a trauma center in this type of setting or in that type of setting? And the college has spent years and decades of experts and with data and evidence to figure out, well, what is a trauma center? What, are, what things are needed? Now, we don't wanna say that, oh, you need 100 people to do all of this stuff, but what is the most efficient way to get the resources there to take care of that patient who is injured? Right. And that's what we do in all of these different, in 18 different areas to really figure out how do we give this optimal care for these patients in these different clinical settings. And I think that, you know, we had talked about trust. Um, we trust our doctors, I trust my doctor. I was thinking about this the other day in the operating room, that this patient going to sleep with the surgical team that trust the anesthesiologist to put mm -hmm. them, it's, it's difficult. Like, you're gonna trust this person to put you to sleep and you don't know what's gonna go on. They trust the, the anesthesiologist, they trust the nurses are terrific, they trust the surgeons <coughs> to do this. We need to keep on doing things to really earn and continue earning this trust. And I think that these quality programs set us up, us, the whole team clinicians team, the hospital leadership team, the community team, to really achieve that quality in the most efficient way when our resources are short, when our money is short. This is the best way to do it. And we've been doing this for a long time and studying this and figuring out what it is. And instead of people just kind of reinventing the wheel and kind of trying, trying, trying individually, we know from hundreds and hundreds of trauma centers, we know from thousands of cancer centers, what are the really good ways of doing things. And so hopefully, we all work together and collaborate on this. The more voices, the better to, to, a, to achieve this quality. And it's continually iterating as we had opened up with it. This is a real continuous process. And so we, we hope this campaign will, will spur on this redoubling of effort. If I Go ahead, and Dr. Edmondson next. Go ahead, Dr. Stanley. Okay. Uh, if I may add to uh, a little bit Dr. Koh said, um, you know, um, as he said, we have 18 programs in the college, 18 quality programs, uh, very robust. And one of the signs that uh, really people are so much interested now in surgical quality is more and more specialties are coming to Dr. Koh, coming to the college that we want a program in our specialty. But what happened is that hospitals are saying, okay, how many programs I'm gonna be right. involved in? Mm -hmm. right. And how many site visits we're gonna have? So the college now is working on how to bring all these together. So it will decrease actually uh, the, the work and the number of people that have to work on these quality programs. And all that probably is gonna come together with QVP, with this, the base for uh, surgery for all these programs would be the same. And then you stagger on top of it yeah. what's specific for each one of the specialty. Yeah. So instead of coming with a side visit for every specialty, may come with a side visit for multiple specialty plus the QVP. Yeah. Dr. Sadar, I appreciate the, your perspective on that because like our colleague um, from the Federation really responded That's to, why I'm saying there's that. enormous <clears throat> amounts of pressure. Yeah. How do we make this as simple as possible? So Dr. Ko, like, as a consumer, I want to be able to go on ways, and you tell me where my trauma centers are, mm -hmm. right? I want to make this easy, and that's not just going to be what ACS does or institutions. It really is going to take so many other partners. Dr. Edmondson. So I was actually having a conversation with Dr. Opelka, um, and I don't see him at the moment, but one of the challenges that we have, whether it's through QVP or for any of the individual programs, NISQIP, TQIP, is really around the, the volume of man hours it takes to do the data collection and data mm -hmm. aggregation. One of the things I think that's going to be really exciting that the college is working on is it, using not only NISQIP, but how do we partner with our electronic medical records Yes. whether it's EPIC, whether it's whatever, to be able to aggregate that data directly as a link from, what, for example, EPIC to, the, to NISQIP 
so that we can get more information that we can then use the, that support, our surgical um, case reviewers, right. to do analytics, not just be aggregators of data. And I think that that's really important because we're not gonna be able to get a lot more individual people to do this kind of work but we have the ability now, particularly with the advances in analytics, big data aggregation, to be able to do that automatically. I love, like bringing in that future of analytics, mm -hmm. AI, maybe not quite chat GPT, but moving in this direction. <laughs> well, I know we're out of time. I want to thank each of you for your sharing your wisdom, your encouragement, really being part of this first national conversation and how we really focus on the power of quality in the launch of this campaign. I also wanna say, like all of us were in, were in the room where it happened, right? As we see the improvements that I know each of you all with ACS as the lead are going to bring forth in terms of how each of us will benefit from them. So thank you in advance. Dr. Turner. So I'd like to thank our panelists. Obviously, your um, thoughts and your expertise are extraordinary, and we really sincerely appreciate you being here and sharing your insights. Um, and I want to thank all of you for participating in this conversation. Um, I am excited about it. I think you heard enthusiasm um, from, from our question, from our panelists. Um, and I know that we all want to work diligently on this thorny, challenging issue. But there are really exciting um, elements to the conversation. There are very exciting things that the ACS is doing to support your hospitals, to support your surgeons, and at the end of the day, to enhance the care of the surgical patient, which is, again, um, our North Star. Um, I, I want to um, let you know also that I'm really inspired uh, by the work of our 87,000 members of the ACS. I mean, this is an opportunity for us to um, impact patients broadly. Uh, the patients that are cared for by surgeons of all specialties, in all environments, the urban and the rural, uh, the quaternary care academic institution, the critical access hospital, the community hospital. We know that most care in this country is provided not in the academic setting, I'm an academic surgeon, but most care is provided in the community. So our goal is to meet hospitals where they are and to help them move from good to great, uh, to coin a phrase, or to move from wherever they are along the quality journey to a better place, because it is indeed a process. Um, this is not something that you do once and you're finished. It is not um, an opportunity for any of us to rest on our laurels, no matter how well we do. Um, but it really is a process that is an ongoing um, effort to continually improve quality. Um, and as Dr. Coe said, um, you know, we have a rigorous verification program. We are leaning into that trust element of our 110-year-old motto, to heal all with skill and trust. We need our patients to know that there is um, a, a seal of approval, if you will, that lets them know that the hospital is engaged in quality, the surgeons are engaged in quality. And so our quality diamond, which I know you saw in the back, which is on the, um, the trifle that you had a chance to pick up, that is really a representation of hospitals that are engaging with us on quality, um, who are willing to participate in this cycle of continuous improvement, um, which is plan, do, review or study, and then act. So this is a continuous process that never stops. And no matter how well we do, there's always another opportunity for improvement. Um, so we're awarding hospitals that meet these high standards, the Surgical Quality Partner Diamond. Um, so you will begin to see that. Um, and that is really a representation that patients can, um, can rely on, that any of our surgeons can rely on, that you can rely on to know that you're partnering with us. There's 18 programs now. There's others that are quite literally in development. Uh, so we will continue to add quality programs because we want to make sure that every patient has an opportunity to be cared for in a program that's one of our, um, our processes. Um, there are more than 2,500 hospitals that participate in ACS quality programs. Um, and so my goal, um, ambitious though it may be, the, the college's goal is to bring our quality programs to quite literally every patient in every hospital in the country. Um, it may be ambitious, but you know, surgeons are uh, nothing if not ambitious and committed. Uh, so um, I know that we want to work with you we want to work with our policymakers. We want to work with the payers. We want to work with every member of the team who is equally committed to this process. 
Um, and at the end of the day, um, we're going to make a difference. Um, so with that, um, our patients deserve nothing but excellence, and I know that all of you would join me in saying that's our priority. As we leave here today, you heard it here first. Um, I appreciate your engagement. Thank you so much for your time this morning, and thanks again to our panelists. Thank you.